Good morning for the last time today. Again, I'm Brianne Letta, a student ambassador for the Fair Media Council this week. Thank you everyone from the last panel for such an interesting and dynamic discussion. Our final session for day two of the news conference, Real and Powerful, features a one-on-one -on -one discussion called Inside the Beltway. Here are Fair Media Council CEO and Executive Director, Jackie Clement, and USA Today Washington Editor, Karen Bohan. Good morning. Thank you, Brianne. And I wanna say thank you very quickly to our morning panels because you folks were just wonderful. I can't express our gratitude enough. Karen, can you hear me? Oh, uh, you need- I can hear you. Okay, there's your audio, great, thank you. Before we begin, let me just uh, give a brief background about you because you are USA Today editor, uh, Washington editor and deputy bureau chief and you have extensive experience in covering politics. And Karen is also a past president of the White House Correspondents Association. So we do thank Karen for joining us today as part of the Fair Media Council's news conference, Real and Powerful. And um, let's kind of ease into it. Uh, the panel that was speaking before you gave a little update on how they are functioning due to COVID. So I'm wondering if you can take us inside the USA Today workings to explain how your staff has been handling working during the pandemic. Uh, well, first of all, Jackie, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, and this, this is a great event, so I'm very honored to be here. Um, we have gotten actually quite comfortable with our virtual newsroom um, amid the pandemic. Um, when the pandemic first happened, um, you know, obviously it's a huge challenge to cover an immense story with, with such huge implications for people's health and, and also for their personal finances, um, you know, and that in, it, in and of itself has been a challenge. But um, in terms of the virtual newsroom um, concept, it's, it's actually been very eye-opening to realize that we can cover a presidential election um, of our Washington Bureau when we are not all in the same room. Um, and it took a leap of faith, but it actually worked really, really well. Um, we have some editors and some reporters who are not directly based in Washington, who are core parts of our team, including an editor based in Des Moines um, and a reporter based in Louisville. Um, so it's been an interesting experiment, but it's one that we have learned a lot from. So give us a little bit of insight into the inner workings of how much staff do you actually have? Because USA Today is one of those household brands that everyone thinks, wow, there must be a million people there, you know? And we have a very, very big staff in terms of the way I think of USA Today is I think of not only the USA Today newsroom, but the Gannett newsroom. And that includes um, our properties all around the country. We have, we have a presence in, in just about all 50 states. Um, and some of our flagship papers include the Arizona Republic, the Indy Star, the Detroit Free Press. And so those um, journalists combined with us, um, we are 3,000 strong, um, and it's very exciting to cover U.S. politics alongside reporters who are based well outside the Beltway and have sources in places like Arizona, um, you know, local party officials, um, and people who are really there and seeing this story unfold from the ground. Okay. One of, one of the reasons we're so excited to have you with us today is because we hear very little information about the inner workings of news gathering inside the Beltway. So let's talk a little bit about, oh, I guess let's start with the before and after of the inauguration and the mood and the atmosphere of covering politics at this time in history. So as I think a lot of people know, um, there has been a very contentious relationship between the Trump administration and reporters. 
Um, and I think a lot of a lot of people, and not completely unjustified in viewing it this way, see it as a symbiotic relationship in the sense that um, Donald Trump, since the day that he rode down the escalator, mm -hmm. he draws people into the news coverage of him. Um, he drives clicks on news websites. Um, he pushes the envelope in what he says. Um, he surprises people um, with policy pronouncements on Twitter and firings of cabinet secretaries on Twitter. Yet he also has called the media the enemy of the people. Um, so that has presented interesting challenges for us um, in terms of how we cover him. Um, and I just want to preface what I'm saying about the contentious relationship by saying that a contentious relationship goes with the territory if we are doing our jobs right as journalists. We are here to be watchdogs. We're not advocates for any administration, for the Trump administration, the Biden administration, any other administration. And I, I can certainly tell you that I've been yelled at and cursed at by um, press secretaries in the Obama administration, um, you know, over things that I've written or things that I've said publicly. Uh, it, remember getting um, just an angry tirade from the deputy press secretary in the Obama administration when I dared as incoming uh, president of the White House Correspondents Association to say that I actually didn't agree with them that they were the most transparent administration in history. Um, all of that said, there has been um, a much more cordial relationship with other administrations, not just the Obama administration. I think it has less to do with, with party, nothing to do with party, in fact, and more to do with the tone set from above. Um, I would actually say that the tone with the Bush administration was extremely cordial um, behind the scenes. There were tense moments at briefings um, and there were times when President Bush got very angry at questions we asked. Um, and there were testy moments with, with the press secretaries of both the Bush and Obama administrations. What is different I think in the Trump administration or what was different is um, I think there is a basic sense of respect among most press secretaries for the job that we're doing, even if they don't often like what we write or what we say on air. And I think that is a fundamental difference with the Trump administration. Um, you know, a lot of times the goal is to um, discredit what we're reporting, frankly, and counter it. Um, and, you know, we are thick skinned and we can handle that, but it, it does make for some challenges. Well, tell me, can, can you draw us a picture? How adversarial did it get at its worst? I think what people saw on TV was about as adversarial as it can get in the sense of when you have the president of the United States um, very directly and on camera insulting a, a woman of color who is doing her job, it's hard to top that in terms of vitriol behind the scenes. Um, and there was I assure you plenty of vitriol behind the scenes, like, you know, just a lot of venting if you asked even a routine question, you know, it was, it was an opportunity to sort of uh, lambaste you because, you know, you're all out to just, um, you know, smear us and, and this and that. Um, other times though, in terms of um, what people didn't see is there were actually times when an exasperated White House aide or two or three or four would kind of say um, in an exhausted way, yeah, I know, <laughs> but um, you know, this is, 
we're doing our jobs here. Um, and it's not to excuse anyone who is putting forth disinformation, but it's just to say that, um, you know, in any administration, we're all human beings and, and we try to deal with each other cordially, but in some circumstances that doesn't happen. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the inauguration day itself, because watching on television is a completely different experience than actually being there. You know, you don't feel the energy, you, you don't know what the mood and the atmosphere is like. Can, can you describe that to us? Sure. So I haven't covered a lot of inaugurations. Um, this one in particular was was an interesting one for me. Um, and I've I covered um, the 2012 inauguration from the Hill. I was there in the audience. Um, and what I tried to do um, last week was a lot of times when I'm when I've been in the role of covering the inauguration, I'm usually multitasking and we're trying to get out stories immediately on, you know, the key quotes that um, Biden or the incoming president has said, and the color, the handshakes, and things like that. Um, so I, I actually had the luxury of removing myself a little bit from the fray, which meant I, I actually got to hear the whole po poet laureate's um, presentation and Lady Gaga, which was cool, um, <laughs> but. That said, um, there was just a huge amount of planning that went into it in terms of making sure that, you know, we were covered in in all of the developments and all of the speakers and, and watching, you know, just um, with a hawk's eye for all of the body language involving Pence and former President Obama and um, you know, all of the dignitaries who were on the stage, because all of that was of huge interest and of even greater interest in the aftermath of the Capitol Hill riots. Um, the other layer to it is we had, we had pretty intense conversations leading up to it about the safety of our reporters and photographers who were in the field and who were going to be on Capitol Hill, um, you know, just very concrete conversations about safety gear. Do we buy a, a, a bulletproof vest? What kind of helmets do we need? Things like that. And so that, I mean, it was a very different inauguration than the ones I'm used to from that standpoint. No, it is. And when, when you put it that way, that sounds like something that doesn't happen in America. That sounds more like covering, you know, a war on foreign territory or something like that. Have you felt that the atmosphere has been unsafe for reporters? Right, so when I was on the White House beat, I went to Afghanistan three times um, on presidential trips. Um, one was a vice presidential trip with Vice President Cheney. In most of them, I was felt extremely safe because when you are inside the White House security bubble, it's a, it's a safe place to be even in a war zone. Um, the trip with Cheney was, was a little interesting because we had um, a roughly hour long trip. We did not helicopter from the airport to the, the um, Capitol. We, we took this dirt road in, in a van with no seat belts um, on this area that where there had been a lot of roadside bombs. Um, and so the reason that I bring that up is in order for my news organization, which at the time I was working for Reuters, in order for them to feel comfortable for me to do those trips, we had intensive hostile environments training. I pretty much went to a one week boot camp with the British Royal Marines, former British Royal Marines, who you know gave us first aid um, training, watched us, had us watch horrible videos about war zones and things like that, all with the aim of making sure that we understood what it was like to be in a dangerous situation and to be able to carry out our duties as journalists in a situation where there, there are unexpected events um, and where we have to worry about our safety as well as getting the story. Um, and in the run up to the inauguration and on January 6th, 
um, itself, you know, all of this training came back to me. Um, and this time I wasn't the one out in the field. I was the editor on the other end of the phone, you know, trying to coach people through and trying to make sure that they knew that their safety was the most important thing. And don't, don't take chances. Don't go too far into the fray. Don't go anywhere where you're not comfortable going. And if things get hairy, back off. Yeah, it's amazing that you had to call in that training for covering yeah. the Capitol, right? Yeah. Yes. Can, can you take us a little bit in, into before the Capitol riots began? What were your what were your first um, the the first notice that something was about to go horribly wrong? When did you find out inside the newsroom? So I usually um, schedule my Christmas vacations and holiday vacations at the end of the year. So I take the first Christmas week off and usually the week leading up to New Year's I'm on because it, the first week in Washington is never quiet. And we knew we had a swearing in of a new Congress. We were getting ready for the inauguration. We knew that on January 6th, that there would be an official count um, in Washington of the electoral votes, which normally is a ceremonial event. Um, however, we knew that President Trump was watching that closely and was very concerned about it. Um, so I and a, and a skeletal group of reporters and editors were monitoring the developments and started to see chatter on social media of Proud Boys leaders urging um, Trump supporters to arrive at the Capitol on January 6th incognito, wearing black, um, and to, um, you know, basically not, not to, um, to appear as if they were Antifa. Um, and that had me concerned because in early December, in the aftermath of the election, there had been violence here in Washington. There had been a, a fight that broke out in a bar and you know, it was definitely rougher than most um, demonstrations that we usually see here in Washington. Um, so we started planning in earnest a week before January 6th, um, planning for the events and planning for um, you know, the political ramifications of all of it, but with a mind towards safety. But I have to say, as, as much as I was afraid of, of violence, when I saw the breach of the Capitol, I was stunned. I have never seen anything like that because nothing like that has ever happened. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you know, you, you had mentioned about information coming out on Twitter. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges of being a traditional newsroom fighting against information coming out continuously, you know, 24 seven out on, on social media channels that may or may not be true. So how do you fight if you're trying to put out information, you have slowed down the news cycle enough to verify facts before you, you put it out, but yet you're competing against anyone anywhere with an internet access, putting out whatever they want. How has that changed your job? Right, so the news cycle is, it moves at lightning speed, as, as you just said. Um, and I always say that you can never be later than wrong. And so it's, it's crucial for us to treat everything that we report with all of the caution it deserves. And things on social media, we have, very strict protocols for how we vet that information, how we vet the um, legitimacy of the information and and whether the account um, is for real. Um, and we fact check rigorously and we don't sacrifice any of that for speed. Hmm, okay. As, you had a president that was very big on making announcements on Twitter. So you never knew what was happening. Let's compare that now. I know it's only been one week, you know, that Biden has been in office, but already there are questions surfacing saying, is the news 
media going soft on Biden just because he's not Trump? That That's a great question. And it, it's definitely something that a lot of people ask us. Um, and, um, you know, I can assure you that our mission is to be a watchdog for any administration, including the Biden administration. Um, there are differences between the last administration and other administrations that I've covered. Um, I think if you look at independent fact checkers um, who have cataloged um, the number of untruths spoken at the White House podium um, by President Trump and, and some of his press secretaries, you'll see a difference, a vast difference in those numbers um, between um, the Trump administration and other administrations. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, the Biden administration or any other administration isn't going to spin um, and emphasize, you know, the positive or, you know, not present all of the context that we would think relevant when, um, you know, discussing their goals or, or how they have performed in terms of handling a given issue. Um, and it just requires, it requires vigilance and it requires, you know, making sure that we always remember that we're there to, to serve our audience. And we can't do that if we're, if we're trying to ingratiate ourselves with our sources. Okay. How would you describe what's been, in, what's been put in place so far by the Biden administration in terms of working with the news media and in terms of general transparency? So I think one of the really positive things that has happened um, for the press corps is the reemergence of the daily press briefings. Um, they have committed to doing them five days a week and Jen Psaki so far has kept that promise. Um, and that is something that um, has been fundamental for the past several decades. The Clinton administration did them every day. Um, they actually did at one point two briefings a day. Um, beginning of the Bush administration, they did two briefings, one on camera, one off, um, all throughout the Obama administration. And I think those briefings are incredibly important because the American people themselves can see how the press secretary is answering questions from the public and you know, if the briefing is a full hour, as it usually should be, it's an opportunity to really drill down on the policies and really, um, you know, ask some hard questions. Okay. There have been times at those press conferences in the past when people started to question, why is the media even covering these now? Because you would have, well, we were introduced to the concept of alternative facts and things of that nature. So if you know what the person behind the podium is saying is a lie or is false, what's your responsibility? Should you be putting that information out there in the public domain or are you then becoming part of the problem? That is something that, that all of us um, in newsrooms around Washington have wrestled with. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one of, one of the things that we and others did is there were, there were times when we had live streams of events um, and briefings and things like that. And other times where we decided we're gonna be selective about which events we live stream. Um, and that is not to say that um, our audience isn't watching the entire event. If people wanna watch it, they can. We don't have to provide a platform to everything. Um, and when we do, if, if there's an important speech and we have concerns about um, whether there may be, um, well, to give you a very concrete example, um, some of the speeches and public statements that President Trump made in the aftermath of the election about um, allegations of a stolen election. Mm -hmm. um, if we knew a speech was coming up like that, we're gonna, we're, we are gonna cover it. We're gonna not 
choose not to cover it. It's news, it's the president of the United States, but we might do a live fact check where you know we um, have a live stream of the speech, but also context in Chiron's about what the facts are about the electoral college vote, about you know allegations of irregularities, whether they check out or not, um, other kinds of things like that. Okay, and how long has that been in as a process for you, the separate fact checking? So it it's really um, episodic. Like it's we don't do it every time. It's very work intensive. Um, so we've we've kind of done it on a case by case. Um, basis if there if there is a big policy speech or something like that and we feel like we need to bring that fact check dimension to it then it's worth taking the time to you know have our reporters with expertise in specific policy areas really dive in and prep material ahead of time that we can put out there so that people not only hear the words that are spoken but also know the context Okay, we actually have a question from one of our listeners right now, which is um, going back to when we were discussing the news coverage of the riot. So would news coverage had been the same had President Trump been reelected and there were riots against his inauguration? 100%. Yep. There, there, there is no question at all. Um, violence of that level in the Capitol, um, you know, it's it was a story that I think every American um, who had a, access to the video was was watching that unfold, um, and it's it's a hugely important story to tell, and we would not have covered it any differently if there was if if President Trump was reelected, if it was a different administration. Okay. We also have another question. How do you reconcile the need to ensure accuracy of information uh, when so often today accuracy is in the eye of the beholder with the First Amendment? And this is in reference to Mike Lindell um, being banned from Twitter. So I would say this, first of all, I can't um, speak for Twitter at all. Um, <laughs> what we do at Gannett um, is uh, is completely separate from that. And, and we don't have a say in their decision-making and nor do they have one in ours. Um, however, um, in terms of facts being in the eye of the beholder, there, I think their opinions are in the high eye of the beholder, but certain facts are not in the eye of the beholder, um, such as, a, a good example of, of that is um, it is a fact that in some of the swing states that were um, challenged by President Trump, the tally um, that showed Biden won was in the tens of thousands. Um, okay. That's not an opinion, that's a fact. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I I think what you're touching on is an overall issue with one education in general right now, but also education about news in particular. Because um, what I see, um, you know, I look at um, studies that say one out of two college students today can't distinguish between fact and opinion. And if you can't do that, how do you navigate today's media landscape, which has basically no barrier to entry? So anyone can say they're a news outlet today. Anyone can put out their own opinion, make it look like it's USA Today. We see, we see that a lot, um, the sites that mimic other news sites so that they come off as credible. How, how do we kind of, you know, get a handle on this issue so that we do know what's credible information, what's not, what voices we should be turning to? Because I'm, I'm sure from your seat, that must be a very, big challenge right now. It is. And I would say that it takes a leap of faith because I think that we need to trust people to understand, To we need to develop a relationship with our audience so that they understand that the information that we're giving them is 
is accurate. And I have zero problem with somebody who has no journalistic training starting a blog or a website and, and being another voice out there. I welcome that and I think that's great. And, and there are times when people starting with very few resources have built entire news organizations that now compete with us. And I, I think that's great. Um, I do think that certain media organizations have built track records of accuracy, um, not only by the journalism that they produce every day, by, but also by owning up when we make a mistake. If we have an error in the newspaper, we should correct it the very next day, the first opportunity that we, we get. And that is how we sort of um, keep the faith with our audience. If they know that you know, the truth is more important to us than sort of being first or being buzzy, then you develop that trust and you know, people are either going to trust you or they're not. And the only control that we have over that is to do our very best every day to deliver the news and, and, and make sure that we are as accurate and, and bulletproof in terms of how we report things as we possibly can be. And how, how would you describe the process of how do you actually build trust? You know, we, we did see a lot um, during the past couple of years of newspapers coming out with truth campaigns, you know, um, basically saying, trust us, we're telling you the truth. And, you know, the flip side of that is the person that you don't trust is usually the person who comes up and says, trust me on this, you know? Um, you don't just say, trust me, you have to earn it before people actually feel you're credible. So how do you earn it? Right, I mean, it's sort of, it goes to me, it, it, it makes me think in a way, like if you are having a heated political discussion with somebody and um, voices are raised, the person who makes the strongest point is not necessarily the person who yells the loudest or dismisses the points of other people. And I think sometimes um, we can feed into that mindset a little bit when, um, for example, we, we assert that something is baseless or false, but we don't give the actual facts or statistics. For example, if if a politician asserts that um, you know the COVID pandemic is is getting better, that deaths are falling, and things like that, it's not enough for us to just say this is a false claim. We've got to actually give the numbers. And I I think I'm surprised sometimes by how infrequently that's done. I think people just you know. They think there's a little bit of an arrogance there and, and where it's, it's sort of a sense that, well, of course, everybody knows this is untrue. So it's enough just to say it's false. Okay. Well, we spoke with uh, presidential scholar Douglas Brinkley. And one of the things he pointed out is that, you know, we basically have two Americas right now of what people are believing. Um, how much of that can we actually blame the news media for? Some people believing what's, what's going on and others having completely different points of view of where we are as a country right now. I think the news media deserves its share of blame for that. Um, <laughs> and as I said, I think our, our highest mission is, is to make sure that we're giving people the truth. I may be an idealist in thinking that we can we can do that, but we can also reach people where they live. Um, and I think that we, as a media, I mean, I think, I think the um, topic, um, the phrase that you use to describe this session is, is very on point inside the Beltway, um, because I think sometimes we as journalists or as news organizations forget that what we are reporting on has huge implications for people outside, far outside the beltway. And we need to understand how to connect with that audience, with, with the wider audience that is, is not in the beltway. Um, and, you know, I think, I think for people to trust what they're hearing and what they're reading, 
I think they have to feel like what we're reporting on is relevant to their lives. Okay. Do you think part of the problem or maybe the whole problem, if, if you view this as a problem, is simply the, the news cycle itself, that it's just so fast? If we slowed it down, would the industry be a better place? I don't think it, if slowing it down is, is the answer. Like, I think the news cycle being fast in a way is a good thing. Like information is coming out more quickly. I used to work for Reuters, which famously used to send information by carrier pigeon. Do I want to go back to that time? No. Um, do I want to go back to the time when journalists sat on buses and no one saw their story until the next day? No, that's not good either. But just because the pace of events moves quickly and Twitter moves quickly doesn't mean that we can't be thoughtful and deliberative in how we cover it. We don't have to, we do not have to cover every event or every remark or every, every um, you know, nickname or insult or, or, you know, anything just because a politician utters it doesn't mean that it's a story. We can still be thoughtful and we can slow ourselves down. Okay, so let me ask you this, because this trips up a lot of people. And, and the definition may, may change over time. It may even be that what you define it as today may be different tomorrow. But what do you consider news? Um, that's a great question and, and one that I learned very early as a 22-year-old reporter when um, I submitted a story to an editor and buried the news. Um, the news is that which is new. Um, it's not news for me to tell you that um, that there is a, a White House press briefing today. You know, I need to tell you why you should care about it and what is what is actually new about that. And it sounds it sounds a little basic, but um, I think sometimes we need to return to that because I think sometimes the news and, and reporters inside the Beltway get very fixated on the inside baseball and the sort of, um, you know, the parlor games and, and the process of politics. The news really is, you know, am I going to get my stimulus check? Mm -hmm. um, where do things stand on, on that latest COVID relief package? What do the climate initiatives that are being unveiled today mean for me? It's, it's interesting maybe that there was a, a fight um, behind the scenes between the chief of staff and, and, and some other aide about you know, how they hashed it out. And you know, it's not that that stuff isn't interesting, but I think we tend to get too focused on that and not focused enough on what does this actually mean for me and my family? Okay, so that media bubble that we often refer to. Yeah. Uh, you just kind of need to break through that every now and then, huh? Right. Um, yeah, but um, you know, we're already over time. So I, I wanna give you the opportunity. Is there anything that we, we didn't touch on that you would like people to know? Um, well, one thing that I would like people to know about our news organization, which mm -hmm. is that, you know, we talk about, you know, the process of politics and things like that. Our mission really is to try to break free of that bubble a little bit. Um, and it is, it is something where, you know, one of the things that we didn't talk about um, that I think is really important is young people, we, we touched on this a little bit, but how do you engage young people in journalism and reading the news? Um, and I think some of it goes to, the, young people do not read newspapers. They do not read USA Today. They may have our mobile app. Um, okay. But the stories that we are trying to tell to a younger audience, um, to an audience outside the Beltway, um, what we're trying to do sometimes has less to do 
with the content that we're giving people than how we're telling that story. And we have to keep up with the times on that. And it just increasingly, if it's video, if it's multimedia, if it's graphics and, and visuals, um, I think that's where a lot of the, the innovation in journalism is heading. Um, so it's less, I mean, we're not moving at all away from journalistic standards, but we're giving people that sense of immediacy by um, taking advantage of, of the tools that are available to us, um, you know, through video and, and different, different types of social media where we can get our news out and get it noticed. Okay. Well, we had mentioned um, in particular with younger people gravitating toward news. What we've seen recently is just basically a renewed interest across the board from the public about news. And it's interesting to me that as adversarial as the relationship has been with Donald Trump, should we not also turn around and say Donald Trump actually got people to pay attention again. They got him, we're now interested in our news product, whether it's on the local or national level, you know, for just for the fact that there are more people involved in the process as opposed to disinterested observers. Is it, is it fair to say he deserves some credit? <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know, I, I think less important than who deserves the credit is mm -hmm. the fact that, um, you know, an election, um, any election can, can garner that attention. Um, and in what you said made me think of a, um, a discussion that I had with a, a class of college journalism students mm -hmm. um, about a month before the election. And I was just amazed at how much they knew about the polls, um, the, the players, um, all of the sort of detailed knowledge that they had of politics and the election and how excited they were about understanding more about it. And I think um, if we can keep up that momentum as journalists and, and maintain that engagement, I think, I think it would be a very good thing. All right. We need to close on that note. Thank you so much, Karen Bohan, for spending this time with us. And I want to thank everyone who has been part of the news conference. And we will see you tomorrow uh, for another day of events starting at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. It was great.